me all the time out the way. I'm gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. George can't hit what his hands can't see. Oh, look at this. Floyd Mayweather dropping his opponent. We are live here, Box Star Forum. We have one on one with one of the boxing uh, greats, uh, England, one of England's big, biggest products here in, um, in the last what, 10 years. Uh, we are one on one with none other than a man you know, on a mission, always the more comfortable Ashley Theopane. What's going on, champ? How you feeling, sir? I'm doing good, my man. Relaxing, relaxing. Yeah, you look like you were like, like a scholar, all those books behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Start calling you Professor P Professor Theopane. Okay. <laughs> um, so I mean the last time we met was your call about, I believe it was about like five years ago. Okay, yeah, yeah, it was. It was maybe a little bit longer, but it was right, right after the Adrian Broner fight. Yeah. Okay, oh, hey, well, that was five five years ago then. That was five yeah. years ago. You just have to ask you uh, um the um uh, Adrian Broner fight. Um yeah. A lot's happened since then, but let's before we get to that, I want to go back in time a little bit because when I, when, you know, when we go one on one with boxers and coaches and you know, um, and personalities in boxing, one of the biggest things that we like to find out and the viewers and the listeners want to know is what brought you to boxing. Yeah. So what can you, so let's get your take on it. Ashley's well, what, what actually brought you to boxing? What age did you come to boxing? Um, so basically, I started to watch the sport around four to five years old. But then I didn't start until I was around eight. So my dad used to watch the big fights in the USA. And then um, he used to allow me to stay up to watch them. And then I would ask my mom and dad if I, if I could try this. Could it look fun? I was a little kid. And I wanted to try it. And my mom and dad would say no. My mom was like she didn't want her son to get hit in the head. Um, so I, it went on for like two to three years. I just kept asking. And then my mom told my dad ah, to bring him down to the gym on Harrow Road. Um, that was the All-Stars gym. And then I went there. I was around eight years old. And then I just had so much fun. And that was the, the beginning. You know what I mean? So, because because you're you're born and bred in a sort of northwest London area. So Harrow Road, Kensal yeah. Rise, Kensal Green. Yeah. So coming up in that era yeah. was, was a pretty rough era. Pretty rough era to be to roll up in. Yeah, um... It was very, it was very rough, but I, I guess, you know what I mean? If you're going to, people who tend to do our sport don't want to be rude to us, but majority of the time, we're not the smartest. We're not the best in school. So sometimes this sport is a great out, outlet, like for us, like troubled kids. And it's helped so many troubled kids like turn their life around. So um, for me, um, you know, I was young. I did. I don't want to say I was a bad, a bad kid, but I got up to no good at times. But this sport, it just helped me to put my energies into, and you know, just to stay on my grind, and you know, to set goals and stuff. So it's helped me in my life. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, you, you, I mean, you've done very well in the sport. I mean, yeah. on both sides of the continent, you know, in the yeah. UK and in the US, yeah. um, it, it is a small world in the boxing community. Um. I had the pleasure of interviewing one of your old coaches, uh, Don Charles. I didn't realize okay, yeah. that you were one of Don Charles. But you were with Don Charles in the very beginning of your career, correct? Um, I was with Don. It was like the middle. It was 10 years ago. So basically, I had um, gone over to the USA. I had beaten the world number three in the USA. And then I was going to fight for the British belt. And um, I basically needed a... I had a, I had a coach here, but I needed a coach to help me, sir. So, Don help, helped me with two of my... Because when I used to go to the USA, I had my team over there. And then when I came back, I done I would train with Don for the last few weeks. So Don helped me in the later stages of camp to um, prepare for the British belt. So I think I trained with Don for like two fights. Yeah, two two fights. A diamond, a diamond of a guy. Underrated as a coach, would you say? Um, Yeah. Like, um, you have to say, say um, even though... Derek Chisora is having some big fights. Derek Chisora, at his best, was with Don. Like, Don got the best out of Derek, Derek Chisora. So, if, they, if, if, if Chisora never met Don, he may not have fought for the world belt. He may not have been British champion and stuff. So, um, I think 
Chisora owes a lot to Don Charles because they just had they had a great connection and Don got the best out of him. And and, and for the two fights I worked with Don, like it was great. It was good. Speaking of Chisora, you saw that last fight when he fought Usyk. What did you think of that fight? Um, like what's it? Chisora does what Chisora does. Like he comes to fight and yeah. um you know, he's found the stage where he's at. So I think right now Hearn just uses him for entertaining fights. He may lose, but he'll make it an entertaining fight. So um, that's basically um, um, where, like where he's at. Now, I think he's achieved everything he's going to achieve. He's, he's passed his best. But right now, you know, um, in the hair, he wake the vision. He's in some... Because you have to think, a lot of folks thought that he beat um, uh, White in the first fight. A lot of folks mm-hmm. thought he beat White in the first fight. And even in the rematch, he was ahead on the cards until he got stopped. Yeah. So, Chizora, if you're not in your A game, Chizora will can beat, beat you. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's good to see that he's getting some paydays now at the end of his career. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, many, how many more years you give him? Well, how many more fights? How many good fights do you think he's like, in? For me, it's weird. You know, when you're on the outside and you see a man, he, he, it's all right to lose, but when you're getting stopped and you're taking it and these guys are hitting hard, like I would like to say like a no for a year, but I don't even think he's that old as well, but he's just, he's been around for so long and he's taken, is he's been in a lot of hard fights. So That's right. it's all good you're getting paid. But this life after this sport, you know, when we retire, we can go on to do so much more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you came through, bo- you came through the, the ranks of, of boxers through All Star Amateur Boxing Club. Yeah. And you turned pro. And when you turned pro, how did you find it coming from the amateurs to the, to the pro ranks? Was it hard, um, so- easy, indifferent? What was it like for you? So for me, so from when I was 18 years old, I wanted to turn professional. But, mm-hmm. but my coach at the time, Miss, Miss Sister AK, was saying that I was too young and wild to turn pro. And because he no, knew at that time in my life, I was still on the streets doing stuff that I should not have been I'm doing. So he, he would always say, like, Ash, like you would get disqualified in fights because I would just go wild if they tried some stuff. So he said, wait until your mind is more mature. So when I was 22 years old, yeah, I said that I want want to turn pro. Now he said, cool, I had his support. So I think for the first three years of my career that I was with him, and um, the thing was, when I was an amateur, I used to love the pros. That's all I used to watch. I didn't like the amateurs. So um, for me, like, Roy Jones was the guy at that stage in my life. I was like, oh, my God, like, Roy. And um, so, like, when I first turned pro, it was cool. But what changed my life or when I started to improve is when I went to New York. So I think it was 2005. I was thinking I was 9-1 and one at the time. And right. I wasn't getting no breaks over here. Right. And I was like, I-, I always wanted to go to, like, America. And I was like, I just want to see if I have what it takes. So I went off to Gleason's gym. Gleason's and that gym. basically was like the start of, of everything. How, how long did you spend at Gleason's gym? Um, the first trip, I, I basically, I went there for a month and then I, I sparred with like loads of like world champions and guys who were ranked on names in the game. And a lot of the coaches there thought I could go on to be like a world champ. So I was like, I've got to come back here. So that was kind of the start where I would basically like spend half of the year like in America because when I was home, no one didn't really think much much of me. But when I was in America, they thought that I could go far. So um, that's why I was just there as much as I could. And then Dimitri Salita, he used to fly me out for camp. So sometimes guys that used to fly me out for camp, so, so for me, it was all about just learning, just trying to improve. So I just wanted to spar anyone, you know what I mean? So that's kind of how I learned just sparring and just worked with so many great guys there. Right. And that, so you, you kind of felt isolated here in the UK, but more love in the US. Yes, yes. And, and, and it's weird because personally, 
still now, I think the US have the better guys there, like the better, the better guys there. And it's weird that I go to a, a place where the sea is more the, is more deep. You know what I mean? It's deep over there. They got so many guys who fly in from over all over the world. And I would shine over there and get so much love over there. Then I would come back home in this little place. And they wouldn't show me no love. So for me, it was weird. And people over there, they just seemed to believe in you. Like I wanted to be a champ, champ, champion. I wanted to be as good as I could be. And they just would say, yeah, you can do it. You can do it. And they would just try to help me. So yeah. it was weird that I would get love in the USA but where I was born and where I was from, I wouldn't get no love at all. Why is that? Why do you think it is? Um, I, I don't, I don't really know, but I know this that it's like my sport is not the only industry that it goes down. Because you got actors, you got folks who sing. They go over to like America. They can't get a break here. And they go over to like America, then you see them in films on the TV. So it's weird. Like when I was in America, I saw so many Brits were living their best life there because yeah. they couldn't get a break here. So it's not just me, but I think the UK, they miss out on a lot of, they, I think they don't show enough love to the people that are here because there's, so there's so much of us who have to go over abroad or go um, to go to the USA to get our big break. So I don't know what it is, but something about the UK, they just don't tap in with what they have. It's, it's funny you mention it because going back to boxing in return, because this is a boxing forum, and yeah. we're speaking about um, the amateurs for yeah. a minute. And one thing I remember Teddy Atlas saying in one of his interviews a few years ago, and this is around a time when Anthony Joshua was shining as, as an amateur, yeah. and this is before 2012. And I remember when I saw... Anthony Joshua and uh, a name you might remember, Anthony Ogogo. Okay, um, yay! As, as an amateur. Anthony came to one of our boxing shows a few years yeah. ago as one of our guests. And I remember when I saw him at 2012. Okay. Uh, was it 2012? Yeah, 2012 yeah, Olympics. It was, it was. The, and I remember going to the XL Arena. Yeah. And as soon as Anthony Ogogo came out, people started screaming. It's like almost like he was a rock star. And I don't even remember who I saw Anthony Joshua fight. Okay, it was some European. I can't remember the name of the guy who fought. But, um, but the attention was on a go-go. I think because he was a pretty boy and all that yeah, kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. But those two guys in particular, I remember. Yeah. And I remember Teddy Atlas saying that what the UK has done recently very well, prior to 2012, sure. was that they invested in the amateur scene. Yeah, they did. They did. They did. A lot of money. Whereas the US was regressing in, yeah. their, in the amateur scene. Yeah. And that's why you saw this emergence of professionals yeah. in the amateurs come out, i.e. a go-go. You saw um, Anthony Joshua, uh, Nicola Adams. Uh, she came out from the amateurs as well. Um, and even Amir Khan had a pretty good amateur uh, career. Yeah, yeah, before so it's really weird you saying that because the U.S. has always been, because I'm from D.C. So the, the yeah, thing about right. the U.S., the U.S. has always been a place where it's always been this land of dream, the land of milk and honey. But it's always been seen as it's hard to get a break unless wow. you're in the right place. So yeah. it's really interesting to hear your take on it, saying you went there and got love. Yeah, well, you know, it was, well, at first I was in New York for, what, eight years? I went to New York for eight years or so, eight right. years. Right. And then it's kind of, I'd, I'd fought some names over there, Chop Chop. Yes, Goss, yeah, Chop Chop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Delvin Rodriguez. And I was ranked fourth in the world there. So, and then I came back home and then I became British champion. So, well, 140? Felt, yeah, yeah. So then I felt stuck because I was in the USA and I'd lost the British belt now and I was like, what next? And that's when I went over to, to Vegas because I was like, I've been in New York for so long, it's time for a new scene. And Vegas seemed like that's where all of the people were now. That's where all the stars were. So then I went over there to try to get onto Floyd's camp. Um, I went over there for a month. Then um, it was going great. And then I went on for like a next month. So it's, it's true what you're saying. In life, to get a break, you have to kind of make your own opportunities. If you stay in the same spot, like if I stayed here, I wouldn't even have been British champion. Like, yeah. so... Sometimes you have to create your own opportun 
True. So if you ain't getting none here, you have to go to somewhere else. Yeah. And um, for me, that's kind of what I did. I went to where I felt I might get a break and, you know, it, it worked out well. Yeah, because um, we'll get to the Floyd thing in a minute because another one of your yeah. buddies, Ozzy, Ozzy Jevier, I was speaking to him the other day and he's a, a gentleman fighter. He's going to come on the show in a few weeks' time. But he was saying he had to leave the UK and I think he went to Europe for a minute. Okay. To get some opportunities in Europe. So you're right. I guess you do have to up and, and roll out wherever it's necessary. But this is what I'm saying. Like, as you say with Ozzy, Ozzy's gone down to the route where he just takes fights for cash. But people don't understand. Sometimes you can't get breaks here. So then you have to do that. Like you lose the ambition. You, you know what I mean? They drain it out of you. So if I had stayed there, that could have been me. But I went to a place where they wanted me to improve. They showed me love and they just poured love into me. Right. So but if you stay in a place that just rips at you, then you're just going to, you know, you're just going to say, oh, I just got to get my money. So what Ozzy's doing now, that could have been me. That easily could have been, been me if I would have stayed, stayed here. So sometimes it's like a thin line of, there's always a path you can take if you want to go left or right. And it, it's just crazy that one decision can change your whole life. Yeah, because you were saying it. Uh, but another thing about you that you got to give yourself credit for, and I didn't notice about you until we were speaking early, that you didn't just take what everyone gave you because mm. you were sort of in your own boss. And yeah. You didn't have to be, you weren't financially dependent on someone or promoter yeah. you were yeah. you had some financial independence yeah so talk about that so you didn't have to li listen to anybody so all right so basically i i was at a gym called a tko gym for around three years and the owner there he used to train me or i was part of the trade and team there and um they basically like if the promoter if it was frank warren or whoever would give you a call with 10 days to go ah oh, do you want to fight for the British belt. And a lot of guys, majority of guys, would jump at the chance to get 10 grand or 20 grand. And a lot of times when they came with these short, they, these fights at short term, I always would say no. And a lot of promoters, they didn't like that I would turn them down. Like, if you're not going to give me, like, two months, don't come at me at all. And I think because... Because I didn't need their cash at that stage. And even now, I've always been hard to work, work with. So even now, just I'm gonna, just going to jump, jump, jump ahead. I left Floyd like three years ago. Hearn tried to get me to fight Josh Tate. I'm um, Josh like three times. He tried to get me to fight Ben like twice or once. And all of the promoters here, they tried to get me to have fights. And because one, I'm not broke and two... I'm my own boss. I don't jump at them. So this is another thing why the UK is the UK promoters. They've kept me out because I don't jump when they say jump. And right. it took me like I fought the other day, but it took them like three years from when I left Floyd to get my last fight here. You know what I mean? Just because if you don't take what they want to give you, they keep you on the outside. So, so even though it's changed, not much has changed from when I started here. Wow. Because they're still the same. If you don't take what they're giving you, then they say, oh, okay, cool. You stay outside. And mm -hmm. because I was financially okay, like I could go on a world tour for two years where I basically didn't make no cash. But I could do it because of what the money I made with Floyd or whatever, and I put it into the right spot. So I was okay for cash. So yeah. this sport is it, sad that most guys they have to jump when a promoter says jump. Right. And for me, I don't know if it was because I was hard hair, hair, did as my dad would say, <laughs> that I just, I don't do that. I don't, you can't tell me to do something and I'll do it. Right. So, so that kind of helped me in my young career because I would have got robbed left, right and thing because I would have just said yes. And then when you take these fights again, the people, if you take these fights, it's sad that this sport is like that that the, a lot of times the person who is supposed to win, they don't win because everyone knows who the main guy is. So even if you do beat him, a lot of times they will just say, no, nah, you lost. And then the commission, they stick up for you anyway. So it's sad that the sport is kind of corrupt and rotten to the core. 
unless unless you knock him out, um, and yeah. especially if you if you take a case like when AJ lost to Andrew Ruiz Jr. Had yeah. that fight have been close, AJ probably would have walked it. Yeah, yeah. But well, um, yeah. You, you know, we know how that fight ended. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because Ozzy has a very similar take when I spoke to him about the the, the fight game, yeah. and it's a, and it's a very good thing we have to try to. And funny enough, funny enough, everybody I speak to in boxing says the same thing, whether they. Uh, up here or down there in their careers, male or female, coach or non-coach or observer, MC or not, everyone speaks about what you just spoke about. That sort of dark side to boxing. Sad. And, yeah. It's interesting. So, I mean, so you, you go to the U.S., hmm. you meet Floyd. At what year did you go to Vegas? All right. So I first went to Ve Ve Vegas in 2012. I went there for two weeks. So I so I was in New York for eight weeks. I was British champion and um, I just wanted to change. I was like, I don't want to be here for eight weeks. Um, I saw that Floyd was it was in camp to fight. I'm caught all. So I said, oh, I'm going to fly over there and train in his gym and watch him train if I can. So I flew over. I flew over there. I went over there. And um. I walk walk to the gym and the I still I still remember it now. The first day that I walked in there, I met a uh, Roger. You know I me. Mean? I met Rog. They mm -hmm. said, "Ah, oh, before you can come in to train here, Roger's got to take you on the pads." So I went <laughs> to Rog. I spoke to Rog, and um, he said, "Who are you?" I said, "I'm the British champion." And then we done some pads. He said, "Oh." You can fight a little bit. I said, "Yeah, I'm British champion." <laughs> you know what I mean? And then so so they allowed me to stay there to watch Floyd train. Um, I watched Floyd train, and then as I started to leave, I walked past Floyd, and then he basically it was private, so no one could come in at that stage to watch Floyd train. So he knew everyone there, but he saw that I was a newbie. So he stopped, stop, stops me, and says, "Who are you?" And I goes, I'm actually fear fan. I'm British champion. So he asked me my weight, like, what is my career thing? And then he looked, looks me up and down, and says, Oh, like we might have to spar. So, I, so me, I was like, Oh, great. That'd be. I, so I, I said, I'm, I'm here for two weeks. If you want to spar, great. So then I left, and then I came back the next next day. Then I was there for two weeks. We didn't spar, but they just showed me love throughout that whole two weeks. So then I come back home. I lose it. I lose the British belt. And then I was here for another six, six, six months. Couldn't get no fights here. So I said, basically, what can I do next in my career? I was like, my last kind of shot is I go to Floyd's gym again. If I can get, I'm signed by Floyd, cool. Like, if I can't, I've got to retire. So um, I went back to Floyd's gym. Exactly a year had gone by. I come back and he said, oh, the British guy's back. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit, he remembered me. A yeah. whole year had gone by and he um, remembered me. And um, I was there for that camp that was Guerrero. And he would wa watch me spar. We would go out for runs. And then at the end of at the end of the fight, like when he won, he just said, yeah, that he wants to sign me, wants to help my career. And um, that was basically the start, you know what I mean? So, which is great. So at 2012, and then you left it, what, 2000? Was it right after the okay. Bronner fight? Did you have one more fight yeah. after Bronner and you left? No, oh, no, no, no. I had two fights after AEB. I had two fights after AEB. Yeah, because I've seen you fought since the Broner fight. You fought maybe like six or seven times since the Broner fight. All right. So now I fought two times with Floyd, but I would have liked to retire with Floyd. I'm still cool with them now. But we, at that stage there, not a lot. It wasn't act, act. They had signed so many guys and there wasn't enough fights for all of us. So I had fought twice in two years. I was like, I'm getting older. I want to retire soon. So I spoke, I spoke to L and I said, yo, you got all these young guys here now. Like, I want to fight back home before I retire. And he said, cool. So then I let I left Mayweather promotions in 2018. Um, so I've I've come back home to try to fight back home, see if I could do do anything here. All of the promoters, they came at me, but everything they came at me with, I, I didn't like, like, I didn't like. Um, so um, I said, you know what? I'm going to go on a world tour and just kind of have fun, like just fight all over, just fight all over the world. So I fought all over the world. I fought 10 times in nine cunt, cunt countries and I achieved my fifth gift pro win. So then after that stage, 
I basically, I basically retired. That was like a year and a bit ago. Because then we went into lock, lockdown and I was trying to open up my own gym. Right. So um, that's kind of how it was. You know what I mean? So yeah. a lot of times I've just had to take control of my um, career because I couldn't get no love back, back, back home. The reason why I left Floyd was to, the sport was doing so great here. And I was like, I want to fight back home. Then I come back home. And then the promoters are still on the same BS. So, yeah. you, you know what I mean? I just thought, all right, I just got on my little tour. Well, and there seems to be a loggerheads between, obviously, the two big ones, Frank Warren and Eddie Hearn. Yeah. yeah. You know, if, and if, you, I, I, if you're not with those, well, either those guys, I mean, obviously, you yeah. have Hennessy, who's yeah. another uh, guy. Well, you got him. MTK now as well, who kind of flow in and out, who work with everyone, yeah. yeah. And then you got MTK Global. So if you're not with any of those guys, then yeah, it's you, really... Yeah, you can't do anything. You can't do anything. Um... So, would you consider yourself retired now, or what are you an active fighter? No, no, no. I, I would say I'm retired now. Like I would say I'm retired. I've done everything I'm going going to do. Um, for me, I've done what I'm, I've done. You know what I mean? I've done what I've done. So, for me, I would like to kind of be the inspiration for guys to on like the small hall, like where we first met at York yeah. Hall, to yeah. know that I started at your York Hall majority not being rude but 99.9 .9 of those guys who are at york or who start there they won't even become british champion mm. so to think of what i started there without a promoter i didn't have a promoter for 10 years and to think that i went on to like to beat the world number three i fought like world champions i, I was with floyd for five years i had hair i'd lined in america like five or six times like what I've done without help from where I was from is unheard of. Unheard, unheard of. of. Unheard of. And even a lot of Brits who go over to America, they go there with the safety net or oh, uh, the promoter. I've fought like 20 times in America. Like Brits don't do that. Brits in the last 20 years, I think there's only one other Brit that's fought there as much ma ma as me. They don't do it. I remember there's a similar story in the U.S. Uh, a legend, Bernard Hopkins. Yeah. Um, most of well, not most of his career. I would say, the, especially, I would say half of Bernard Hopkins' career, he fought without a promoter, okay. because some said he was just too difficult to work with. And yeah. for the same thing you you mentioned, he didn't want to work with Don King, um, who was the the big dog at the time. He didn't want to work with Bob Arum. And for a lot of times, arguably, it wasn't until the latter part of his career when he teamed up with Golden Boy that he started making some serious money yeah. because he was like yourself. He was like, well, I'm not going to fight when you say, I'm not going to jump when you say jump. Yeah. I'm not going to fight who you say fight if it doesn't suit my terms. Yeah. And so it was hard for him to get the fight and the recognition he wanted yeah. because of that, that um, notion. And it's really weird because Amer England is a much smaller country or the UK is a much smaller country. And for that to happen here, it almost uh, is it's, it's impressive and it's also pleasing when you see people like AJ, who literally is his own boss. Yeah. So he doesn't actually fight for a yeah. promoter. The promoter kind of works with him. With him. Yeah. Um, but you were mentioning earlier that a lot of times you can credit Floyd Mayweather for that because he was the beginning of all that. I would probably say arguably De La Hoya started that sort of stuff. Okay, but... Who I would say the first British fighter to do it here, Audley Harrison. Yes. He was the first man to be his own boss. So even though he made mistakes, but that's what you're supposed to do. You go out there, you take the chance, and the people who come behind you, they will learn from you. So yeah. AJ, Amir Khan, they've all learned from Audley because Audley was the first one to do the TV deal. He was the first one to promote himself and to bring along guys. So yeah. that's why I did. I forgot to mention him. So over here, I think it was 2004. Like he's like the one who started it. And again, he doesn't hear his name. You don't hear his name. He's no. living in America. But again, look, 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 he's living in America now. He's in a better place. He's in America. So this is what I'm saying. It's weird. America seems to show more love. It's something about that place. As much as it's got its issues, it's got it's got loads of issues. Hence, you're over here. You, you know, <laughs> what I mean, you got your wife over here. Whatever it yeah, is. Yeah. But but this is what I'm saying. Sometimes you just where you're not from. Sometimes you just get more love. It's, it's yeah. weird. 
That is true. I remember watching Ollie Harrison and in the Olympics when he won gold at the time was a record because remember Lennox Lewis is actually the greatest British fighter, I would say, my, he's, he's in the last ever, period. Yeah. He's the last yeah. undisputed heavyweight champ. But when he fought for gold in the Olympics, he, he represented Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if he was here, he would have won gold here. So when yeah. Aldi won gold, he made history because he was the first Brit heavyweight to win gold yeah. as a heavyweight. But yeah. putting that aside, from his career, although his career didn't go where everybody wanted to go, yeah. but you're absolutely right. He took control of his life because I think he saw early the gangster move with the Warrens and everyone else. And he said, nah, I'm doing my own thing. And he created A4, I think it was A4. Um, yeah, A4 um, promotions, promotions or whatever yeah. it was. And he done well. He made a few mil off the game. He did well. Yeah, yeah. Deontay didn't go his way. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is what it is. It is you got to cash out. Wait, if you look at majority of pros, greats or not, their last fight, majority of the time, it's a cash out fight just to get the money. Yeah. You got David Hay. You got Tony Bell, Bell, Bellew. Like, of recent years, they both knew that they were done, but they wanted their cash out fight. Yeah. You know, that's how it goes down majority of the time. Well, Belly always told David, hey, thanks for the fight because those two fights I can feed my family for the rest right. of their life. Yeah, we right. never have to starve again. Right. So you're right about that. About. I mean, I, I wanted to touch upon the, um, your boxing career because your boxing career really has some highlights in it. When you fought Broner, mm. would you say that was your highlight fight? Um, that fight, I would say, you know, it is that fight, even though I lost, that was the fight that I wanted as like a five-year-old kid when I used to watch the big fights in the US, USA. So for, mm. for, for my, so for my kid self, I was proud of myself. Like, Ash, you as a five-year-old child, you wanted this and, and all the stuff you had to go through, no love where you were from, you went to the USA You've been robbed, robbed some fights, but you just kept on. So I think I was 35 years old. So 35 years old, you finally got your world title shot. So um, for me, I was proud of myself. Even though I didn't win and I wanted to win, I was very proud of myself. Let's go back in time during that promotion. What was the promotional roller coaster like for that fight? Was it was it wild? Was it because he was, he was obviously with TNT. Broner is Broner, as you know what he's yeah. like. Yeah. What was Broner like dealing with as a person building up to that fight? Um, so f like for me, like throughout the years, I had watched AB in his previous fights. So I knew what AB was about and I had met him like beforehand. We had met beforehand at the gym and, and whatever. And so before the fight, me and him were always been cool. If I see him, he'll always be cool, blah, blah, blah. So when so when the build up and everything. I kind of was just chill. I know that he talks a lot of shit and he says, but I, my thing was, as long as he doesn't put his hands on me, then we're cool. Because otherwise we're going to fight on the stage, whatever it is. Yeah. So the whole build up to it, I enjoyed it. Like Floyd would come in the gym and saying that he's doing this online to get in his head and, and that. So Floyd would come to me and say, I've done my part, Ashley. I've got you to fight. I told you I was going to get you um, the fight. And the fight's here now, so I can't fight for you, so it's up to you now. And, you know, so the whole thing, I enjoyed the whole build-up. The whole build-up was great, because this is what I always wanted to do, because I, I started this sport to be in these big fights, and it was great. So even the walk towards the ring when we was going to fight, it was like, like wow, like we were sold out in DTC, I think, and... um. It was, it was just great. The first round, the crowd was going wild. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's a shame I didn't have loads of those kind of nights, but mm. to do it just one time, was, yeah. you know, it was great. I'll never forget it. it it's funny because you, um, when Cal Zaki, before he retired, his last few fights, you know, he fought yeah. Roy Jones Jr., one of your, you're one of your icons, mm. and he fought Bernard Hopkins. And he was always saying that, man, before my, I hang my, my, my boots, my gloves up, I just got to fight in Vegas for once in my life. And I think that was like, he said, was one of the highlights of his, his career. But going back to the AB thing with the AB fight, obviously you had fought Broner and you knew what Broner was about. But at that time, things were a bit hostile between AB and the Mayweather camp. He didn't really get on with Floyd at, at that time. Yeah, um, I think with AB and Floyd, they kind of, it's weird. 
from the very first day that I signed with Floyd. So we're talk, talking about 2013. We went, me and Floyd, we went out for a run and he said to me that I want you to fight A, B, like I believe you can win. This right. is three years before I actually fought A, B. Right. So Floyd in his mind had already had that plan. Right. So, and then what, what made the fight go down? It was before the Bert Berto fight. Um, we went out to eat um, with, with um, Floyd and Floyd told me at, and at, at, at the place that he wanted me to fight AB next for the world belt. He said, because AB was, was I'm supposed to fight. And he said, I want you to fight AB next. So, and he said, I believe you could win. So when I started to do interviews and so AB, he didn't know who, who I was. He just knew Ashley. So mm -hmm. when he, he started to hear that Floyd thinks that I could beat him, he must have thought, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> so straight there, that's what I'm saying. So I had I was back home and then um so went straight after his win. So it had been on his mind straight after his win, he announced that he wants to fight me next. Because he's like, Who the fuck is Ashley? <laughs> and he, like, put him on a plane, put him on a plane, like who the fuck is Ashley? So um, <laughs> like for me, for me, it was great that a world champion. Like a full weight world champion called me out because he wanted to fight me because Floyd thought I could win. And the funny thing is, I sparred with Floyd like five times, and um, I always would do good with Floyd. Like I don't know if it was the styles or whatever. And um, so Floyd would always say, "If you can spar, if you can fight the way you spar me against AB, like you could, like you will win." But that's the the sad thing in this sport. Sometimes we perform better in the gym than we do in the actual fights. And that's kind of, when it came to the fight, I didn't perform how I could, what, how, how everyone knew I could, and I, I just didn't perform. So that, that boils down to my next question, the psychology of boxing. Hmm. So as a fighter, fought at the highest level, fought on world levels, there are levels to the sport, right? Yeah, there is. There's and, levels. you know, I only did, myself personally, I only did, amateur boxing you know yeah. and the kid growing up in dc and maryland because as you know when you're coming from the hood from the streets everybody fought yeah, so yeah, yeah. boxing was just something you did because it was just a follow-on from what you did on the streets for free mm -hmm. and when you're in the moment this is what a lot of people don't understand about boxing when you're in the moment nothing else around you even matters it's like it doesn't even exist but when you're in that moment that psychology how did what changes in that moment? Because obviously you've done it at that level, I haven't. What changes at that moment as opposed to when you're in the gym? Because obviously it's a big difference. Yeah. Um, well, you got the crowd, you got the corner. I think the, the thing was my coach, Nate Jones, was saying, Ash, Ash, you got to fight hard, you got to fight hard. And I was saying, Nate, I'm fighting hard. I'm fighting hard. <laughs> so the thing, the thing was with A B. For me, it was weird. Every time he hit me, I don't know if it was a size thing on the night. Every time he hit me, he hurt me. And mm. I, and there's one thing that I've always been proud of. I got a good chin. Like I, I had, I've been, before my last fight, I had, been, I had been pulled down once in 660 fights. Like I got a good chin, like never been hurting in um, the gym. Like, so that was one thing I knew that you wasn't going to stop me. Like, in my head, I'm never getting stopped because my chin is on point. Like, I've been dropped once. Yeah. And I got up and won that fight. And um, it's just, it's just, it's, it's weird. It was just a little thing. Like, where our game plan was that AB, he doesn't throw a lot. And I was just going to outpunch him by, like, two to one or three to one. So, in the gym, that's all we were doing was just doing the count stats. And I was doing, like, 100 pun pun punches around for 12 rounds. So fitness wise, I was there, but I'm not sparring with AB. So a lot of the guys who I sparred with, they had the style of AB because they were fans of AB, but they didn't hit as hard as him. Yeah. So when he hit me, I, I felt it. Like mm. whenever he hit me clean, it was like, fuck. So I, I just had to bite down and just throw what I could. But I was wary of his power because when, you know what I mean? He didn't throw a lot, but when he threw it, you know what I mean? And the thing is, even like Sean Poor, Poor, I think he's never been stopped. But AB put him down. Yes, right. Like that, you know what I mean? He doesn't really go down. But 
So this is what I'm saying. AB's strong. Like, he doesn't throw a lot. But for, for me, that was the takeaway, like, from that fight, that he was very strong. I don't know if it's because he didn't make weights so that he was able to blow up a bit more than me. But yeah. in the fight, it was just that whenever he hit me, I was like, shit, that fucking hurt. <laughs> That's what it was. That's what it was. And I just had to fight through the pain. You know what I mean? Fight down your gum shield. Yeah, yeah. That's what it was. And I was just... But our thing was always get into the championship rounds, like 9, 10, 11, 12, because that's when he starts to fade. And my fitness had shown that I could do 1,200 punches in the 12 rounds. So mm. that's why the team from the outside the ring was saying, Ashley, you've done this in the gym. You've done mm. this. So I could hear them. You've done this in the gym. Throw. Because they knew I could do it. They knew I could do it, but I wasn't doing it when you had to do it. Mm. So this is another thing. This is what Floyd always says. I might have a bad day in the gym, but I never have a bad day when the lights are on. Mm. You know what I mean? So that is that is a thing. And with me, I was like in America, because I always wanted to prove myself in these gyms, I would, it would always, and a lot of these guys, when I first went to America, they wanted to beat up the British kid. So it was, I always had to prove myself in these American gyms. Mm. You know what I mean? But sometimes, sometimes you could take it to the fight, but just on the night that I needed it, I couldn't, I couldn't produce my, the goods. So that's why Floyd is a great, because yeah. Floyd always, well, he's never been defeated. So we, he definitely um, always showed up on the big nights. But going back to his ability is unquestionable. In my mind, how people still criticize Floyd is beyond me. I, I'm still trying to get my when head When he dies, he probably will be, like, appreciated more than what he is now, like, when he's gone. Yeah. So speaking of that, let's go back to the promotional side of things. Yeah. Fighters now are taking control of their boxing careers as opposed to when you were coming up. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily because of, we spoke about the Ollie Harrison effect, but we also talk about now the Floyd Mayweather effect. Yeah. Now, fighters are doing a Floyd now. Talk about that for a minute. How influential is what Floyd's done to the world of boxing? I think, I think it's big. If you look at a lot of the PBC guys, a lot of the guys who are with Al, you've got Errol Spence, Danny Garcia. A lot of these guys are... Uh, doing or trying to do what Floyd did and because Al is the guy who might make the deal, he might make the fights, but you are allowed to say yes and no to what you want to do. Right. So um, like what Floyd did, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think we will see the amount of money that he made, maybe not in my lifetime, I don't know, but he, he was great and he would want us, even though we were with him as a promoter, he would want us to control our careers and have it for say. So if there's mm -hmm. fights that they would come up to us and say, do you want? And if you say yes or no, like my only thing would always be if, 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 if L came to me and he gave me a call to say, Ash, do you want uh, this fight? My thing is, what are they paying? That's, that's, that's always the main thing. Like what is it? Like what is the pay? So, um, and that's what a lot of guys that, cause Floyd, that's one thing I would say with Floyd he always, a lot of the guys that were starting out, they needed to pay their rent. If You know what I mean? If they needed an advance or if they needed some cash, he would always help them. And um, for me, that's why I respect him. Even though there was times you come up to me, say, you're Ash, do you need anything, blah, blah, blah. And I think that's why I, I would always say, no, nah, I'm good, Floyd. I just wanted my fights. Mm. And even, even though I left Mayweather Promotions like, like two and a half years now, like when he came to the U UK like last year on his tour, I left them for two years now, but I can still go and see him and hang out. So that's kind of how I liked our, rela our relationship. Because I'm not American, it's weird. Because I'm not American, I always was like not the same as them, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. They're kind yeah. of loud and stuff. And I was just, yeah. just kind of chill. Yeah, yeah. And I think that our relationship was not the same as what it was with their of American guys that he signed. So we always got on and still get on now. If they're in town, I can see them and hang out and stuff. So you spent about uh, about four or five years with Mayweather Promotions. Yeah. What, what is Floyd like behind, away from Bob? Is he just chilled or is he just still raunchy, loud, boisterous? 
Uh, Because I've heard a few different takes, but what what, 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 um, what do you like? Like, for me, I think he likes to have fun. He likes to laugh. He likes to talk. You know what I mean? He likes to have fun. He likes girls. Like, we know he likes girls. You know what I mean? (laughs) So, and, you know what I mean? So, I I think, overall, I like the man. You know what I mean? No one's perfect. But him, what what he's done, he wants to help out his community. Like, with Ve- Ve- with Vegas as well, like when he used to fight there, they used to make so much cash there because folks were flying from all over the world. So I think he doesn't get the praise that he deserves because all of his friends around them, a lot of them are the same people that was there when I was signed to him like eight eight years ago. Like, no, nah, sorry, it'll be nine years, it'll be eight years ago now. So he keeps the same people around, around, around him. Like sometimes it's people you fall out with and stuff. But for me, that shows that no amount of money that he makes, he's still real with the people that he's with. You know what I mean? Like his family, his friends. If they like he look law, he looks after them. So I think that's good. You know what I mean? Like well, let let L B, I remember yeah. um it was before the Hatton fight, and he was saying Leonard L B was with him. When they barely had any money, so when he yeah. so a lot of people don't know this, but he he put this out there. When he became pro, he was signed onto a top rank, Bob Aaron. Yeah, and everyone knows he famously bought his way out of his contract yeah. to have his own control, which was unheard of even then. Yeah, and he signed a high six figure deal to Bob Aaron yeah. to pay his way out of his contract. But he said he remembers times when the first fight or the first couple of fights. If Bob said he didn't have enough money to pay him because obviously he had uh, Oscar De La Hoya, who was yeah, his yeah, golden yeah. egg. And he would say, OK, Floyd would say, all right, you got 25. All right, give me 25. 15. All right, give me 15. All, right, all you guys, 20, 30, 40, 50. Give me that. And he yeah. would take that money because he, he, he was always viewing the bigger picture. Yeah, Floyd was. he always believed in himself. He always believed in himself. Yeah, that, that's one thing I can say about this fighter. Um, in my mind, and we'll get to this, or your top 10, your top five fighters of all, of all time. But. The reason why for me he's in that my, my top five list of all times is because A, it's not just what he did in the ring, it's what he did outside the ring. And it's it speaks volumes. And I always and Bernard Hopkins always said this about and I always talk about people like B Hop, because to me, B Hop was phenomenal. Yeah. But B Hop said, if I Lance Armstrong pulled off the biggest con in, in sports history. And A, because he was a white guy, because everyone believed his white cyclist was just phenomenal. And then it was a con because he was drugged up to win seven Tour de France. But he, he was basically making a point, even though B-Hop didn't choose the most eloquent of words, but yeah. said, imagine if I was Lance Armstrong and I did what I did at 45 years old, beating these young kids, winning world titles at 45, you'd have a mural of me outside every goddamn um, boxing yeah. arena. But because I'm B-Hop from Philly and yeah. I keep it real, I don't get there. Yeah. It, 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 it's kind of true, isn't it? It, it is a shame that in these times it's still race plays a big part on how people are seen you know what i'm saying like if a white man does does this it's like wow but if a black man does say he don't get the same amount of praise because floyd would always say if i was a white man shit would not it would be a whole different thing they would praise me all the time but because i'm black and i say some things that they don't want me to say or they don't like what i say you know what i mean because he said, so he, he stacked so much things that he's achieved, no one else has done. So, as you can see, why he calls himself T the best ever, because he's broken so much things, done so many things, he's got a right to call himself like TBE if he wants to call himself that he's never lost, like he's broken this record, that thing. He's made, I don't know, like 300 million in one fight, 200 million in another fight. Mm. No one's ever done that. And the, the thing is, a lot of these fans, like they get mad at a lot of guys, a lot of the young champs now, and even Floyd, because they won't fight this guy when they want them to fight him. But your favorite guy, Ray Robin, Robinson and all them guys, they for everyone. They're so great, but they ended up broke mm. and disrespected. So mm. the... So the, the guys of today, they're smarter now. They're yeah. like the champions of the past. They ended up broke. I'm not ending up broke. Like, fuck what you fans think. When I retire, 
You're not paying my bills. When I retire, you don't care about me. Gerald McKellen. Mm -hmm. Man's injured. Man's blind, deaf. Like, no one don't care about him now. They say, oh, he used to breed dogs to fight and he was evil to dogs. Oh, yeah, like he, he deserves what, what he gets. But this is what I'm saying. We get one career and we got to make the most out of it. Because when the lights are gone, nobody doesn't care about us. There's yep. some... Is some UK champs they say when you they want to go to the fights that her and Paul son and they ask her and uh, her and I can come to your fights, her and puts them way at the back. <laughs> you, so, so, this, but hey, but the funny thing is, when I go to the USA, I'm not signed with Mayweather promotions no more. If I ask them, boom, I want I'm coming, I'm flying over to come to this, this fight, they put me in the front rows front row still like I'm I'm like one of theirs and even Floyd when he came over like like last year he he even I didn't even know that he was going to do this but he said ah oh, like where's Ashley where's Ashley I said I'm here he said yeah like Ashley Fiofane was the first guy that I signed like from over here you know what I mean like now I've signed like two others but this is what I'm saying they don't have to show love to me no more but you know what I'm saying? They, they're not perfect, but they still treat man with respect. That's right. That's so that's right. why I have to respect them. Because yeah. I know that certain other promoters who try to go on like they're the best, like Hearn, they yeah. don't do that to other guys. They put mm -hmm. them at the back. Yeah. And I've been, I've been there, I've seen it done. So it's sad that there's some of these British greats here and when they ask to go to shows, they get put at the back. When they should be put at the front because it's because 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 of them that the others are able to do what they're doing now. I don't I don't understand why they don't praise. You got Duke McKenzie. Man was a free weight world champion. Yep. You don't see these guys on Sky or wherever. Like they're not praised enough. That's yeah. just my thing, man. Like it, yeah. it's sad that we're like that here. Yeah, I, I I um speak of Duke McKenzie, I heard it the other day. Um, and it was it was um it was kind of sad to say, but you know, Floyd always made um point of that when and it, some of the tb thing one of the reasons why floyd called himself te because no one else would so that's the first thing and second of all he was i, I mean obviously i can't speak for floyd because obviously he's a man he's his own man hmm. but I, I i get it i get the whole tb thing because in some respects he felt disrespected of his achievements he felt undermined um how could you undermine or disrespect a guy who's done what he's done in the sport of boxing is hmm. or any sport you know, mm. um, it's, 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 it's unfathomable. And um, he had to do that just to kind of like, because now you mention TBE, even if you don't want to mention TBE. If you yeah. mention, you say, oh, you're the TBE guy. Because you've, he's, he said it so much and he's very clever. And Leonard Ellerby always said that when you, you don't think of him as, Leonard said he thinks of him as a genius because he thinks of him when he speaks, like you mentioned to him like. When you, you ran with Floyd one day and he said to you three years prior to fight Adrian Broner, yeah, I think you should fight Adrian Broner. And, and Leonard Ellaby was saying, that's how he thinks. He thinks ahead of, ahead of, uh, way ahead. And you're like, really? And then it happens. You're like, well, I just told you that three years ago. Man. <laughs> you know that, ain't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For real, for real, for real. Yeah, for and real. he said, that's the mind of someone who has a genius brain or someone who, genius is probably a bit, a bit rich, but you know what I'm saying. Someone yeah, yeah, yeah. He thinks, thinks he ahead. Does. He plans ahead. Like... Plants he plants ahead. seeds, like he plants seeds. Yeah, and he, he's outside the box. He thinks outside yeah. the box. And that's why I respect the guy, and he's in my my um, my um category here. But I want to talk to you before we go, because I know we've been on for a minute. I want to talk to you about the British boxing scene, because yeah. you got to mention the British boxing scene. There are yeah. some big some big names out there right now in various weight classes. Yeah. Um, But it's definitely the heavyweight scene is the one everyone's talked about. Yeah. But I want to talk about the light heavyweight scene for a minute. So okay. light heavyweight scene is a is, is a loaded it has a it's a it's loaded with names and we got some heavyweights in the light light heavyweights that I like and I know you 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 uh you either know them or like them yourself. One of them is as is, um uh, Tundai Jai is a fighter Anthony okay. Young. Yeah, yeah, and the other one is Anthony Boatsi. Okay, right? Boatsi, yes. Um, what's your view of either of those guys? Um, well, Yard, I, I've I've known Yard for. Eight years now, because he actually sorry, yeah, I've known him for eight years now. Cause they I they actually used to come over to like um camp in Floyd's gym where I was there. So there was a time that one of um 
Ton, ton of these guys was gonna get signed by um Floyd, you mm. know what I mean? So um I've seen them spa train and everything. So for me, they they get a lot of hate, but because I've seen them from eight years ago, from before he was pro, I've seen the grind. So when yeah. I see man in these big fights, like I'm proud of you. Yeah. And like when I see him at the shows or whatever, like he's still cool, like it hasn't gone to your head where you don't forget, man. Like you're yeah. cool. So um for me. And even with Tunde, I'm going back now to 2006 mm. when I first heard of Tunde when I, I was training at the TKO gym because he used to train Kevin Mitchell. And okay. um, Kevin Mitchell, he used to train with one of the coaches there. So they hated Tunde because he was seen as he stole him from him. He didn't steal him. He basically just wanted a change of coach and he wanted Tunde to train him. And um, so for me, that's the first time I heard of him. So I didn't know of him. Then I hear of this Tunde guy. So this is 2006. Mm. So this just shows like 2006 to where we are. Like I've known of man's grind for years. So sometimes it takes you many years. Look at that. That's 14 years, 15 years to get to where you are, like all of, you got so much you have to give to this sport. You have to give in life to succeed. So people, they only see you overnight, but they don't see with Anthony Yard, like the eight-year grind that I've seen to him to get to where he is now. And with mm-hmm. Tunde, the 15-year grind I've seen from him to get to where he is now. So for me, knowing these guys on a personal tip, like I'm proud. I'm proud when I see guys at the bottom and then I meet you at the top, or what? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 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 it's just yeah, nice to see that you believed in yourself. You worked at it. You didn't care what all of these guys said, and you ended up there. You ended up where you thought you would be. Yeah. And yeah, with and Bu- um, I'll say this. Um, I m- I met him. I met him. When did I meet him? Was it? It was before the shows got so. So around a year and a bit ago, I met him. And the funny, the funny thing was, I met him at York Hall again. Yeah. And then he stopped me. He said, oh, I actually feel the same. Boom, boom. And he gives me a shake. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, he knows who I am. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, um, I've, I've watched him fight once. And I've heard so much about, 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 about him. But I don't know. I've heard much, but I don't know a lot about him. But for me, just that thing there, like, he's just so cool. Like, you know, he's just doing his walk by. And he just comes. Same like AJ. So, so I'm going to go into this. Same like yeah, AJ, yeah. AJ. So obviously, I know who AJ was because AJ is the big star of the UK. Yeah. And um, I must have been at an event with Floyd. And then AJ comes up to me, said, I'll ask you. And how you doing, man? And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> he knows who I am. So like, it's, 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 it's weird that <laughs> some of these guys who you know are big stars, mm. like... I would have went up to him and say, yo, boom, cool. How you doing? But he went out of his way to come up to me to say, yo, to just pay respect. And that, yo, Ash, man, how you doing? Thing. So little things like that just make me respect you even more. So when I see a lot of, I don't know, fans, they diss these guys online, I like to stand up for them because like, I think they're genuine. So with AJ, I like to see him suck, succeed because to me, he comes across as so genuine. You know yeah. what I mean? And with Buwetsi, I've met him once and I, I see what he's doing. I know he, a lot of people say that he's going to, I've heard that he's going to be like another whole, 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 holy field. That's what I've heard of him. Like That's, people that, that's what I think of him. I was going to say okay, exactly the same thing. That's big because holy field is one of the best area. area, area but holy field, what he done, I, he was phenomenal. Like people don't know. I remember with the, Dwight Quow fight, the Dwight Quow Muhammad fight. Yep. He had that in like his eighth fight or something like the eighth fight or tenth fight, something like that. Yeah. He was just a beast from young. Yeah. So for him to even be put in that name description, he must be good. But a lot of these young guys, I don't like to watch them until they're in like a, a big fight. So the first, I watched Yard, I've watched Yard before once. But I watched Yard when he just lost his fight because I was like, this is like a biggish fight. Oh, no, I watched Yard twice when he fought three times, when he fought for the world belt 
And then when he fought the Linden, yeah. So when he lost the Linden. So with Yard, um, you know, there's certain things that he needs to work on. Like he has to work on his jab and stuff. But he has all the tools um, to be a world champion. But with Buwaxi, I haven't, I've only seen him once and he disposed of the guy pretty quick. So um, I you can just think- go on what I've heard about him. So, so no, uh, after he lost him in the Arthur fight, there's a lot of criticism coming from about the yard camp saying that maybe Ashley, um, sorry, Ashley, uh, Tundai is maybe not the right one from anymore, and blah blah blah. Mm. What do you make of all of that? What, what should, what, what, if you were to advise him, what do you think he should do next? See, the, the thing is in this sport, um, there's we have one shot at this. So you can't stay with a coach just because you get on with him or you guys click. If you guys ain't getting the results in the big fights, you guys have to go back and see, like it's both of them, you guys have to go back and say, why didn't it go like this or why didn't we do this and that? So they've lost twice together now. Um, I probably would give it a, like an, another loss and then I would go, but even... Even if they decided to part ways, Tunde still manages him. So he's still going to be linked with him regardless. And just because you split doesn't mean a friendship ends or, you know, like he might seem as an uncle or a big bro. They've been together. I've known them to be together for eight years. So they've yeah. probably been together for longer mm. than that. I think, yeah, for longer than that. May be 10. So their relationship is deep. Yeah. So um, I think I think it would actually be a decision that they probably would sit down and make together. Like, boom, like we've lost twice now or three times now. Like may, maybe it's time to go to someone else. But um, it, it, see, for me, Yard, if Yard was to leave, I don't, I don't want it to sound like disrespectful, but if, if Yard was... If Yard did eventually leave like Tunde, my thing would be he has to go to America to train with one of them. Yeah. I couldn't think of a British guy that I think I would say to go and train with. I, yeah. I can't think. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can't think of one. I, I, you know what I mean? So for me, if if um if he was to leave him in the future, I think that America would be the place that he would have to go. Good point. And, and at some point, there they, they may be a time when Boatsy goes head to head with Yardi. That's one to talk. What do you think happens in that fight if that does happen? Um. Well, I haven't watched enough of Boatsy. But again, I don't think that fight would actually go down unless it's for a world, a world, a world, a world belt. Because there's, there's no need unless. Unless it's like they're not going to fight for British or European, so for me, like they're never going to fight each other unless it's for the world. And um, you know what I mean? Like anything can go. Anything. Obviously, that um, Yard needs to work on some things, but he was seconds away from being world champ. This sport is such a thin line because Kovalev, he had him. I don't know if it was the tenth round or whenever Eighth Kovalev round. was out of it. Eighth whatever round. round it was. Kovalev was out and if that bell did not go like you know what I mean if he had you know what I mean so he would have been world champion so it's weird how little things can determine your path because he easily could have been world champion at that night and if he was then Tunde would have been this great coach you know what I mean that's right and those are the margins that we spoke about yeah um AJ, going back to AJ now, yeah. AJ and Fury are proposed to be fighting. Yeah. Um, they got the, the, all they got to do is to wrap up the paperwork and yeah. other loose ends. Who would you like in that fight? Um, see, going, if you go by like Fury, Fury's last fight, he looked great because he just ran through Deontay, which I didn't think, I didn't think he had that out. out, out, out but I was very surprised. But AJ, I think a lot of people booed him for the way that he won against Ruiz. But I think AJ showed he can fight on the front foot and he can fight on the back foot. So I, th- I think it, it depends the way they fight. I think it's a 50-50 fight. 
Like, so I don't want to pick a guy. Mm. I think AJ can. I think AJ could win by KO. And I always thought that Fury, if he was going to win, he was going to outbox box him. He would just use and just try to box and move. Mm. But after seeing him last fight with Wilder, he might actually think that he could stand there and fight with AJ, which I never thought that he could in the past. Mm. But he's shown us that he's got power. Like, this power came from nowhere. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the other contender on the outside is Dillian White, who's going to fight Bovatkin in a rematch. Yeah. How do you see that one going? Um, I would like um, White to win, because again, that's what I'm saying. I see I'm um, old boy in this game. I always remember when White fought on my undercard when I was British champion. Like, bloody hell, how long ago? So this is like nine years ago. So again, me seeing a young man come up like where he started to where he is now. Um, he should he should have fought for the world belt like a long time ago. And it's a shame at the final stage that he lost to Povetkin. Yeah. Because Povetkin was supposed to be a fight that he would have won easy. So um just the way the cards fell um is is his thing. But he should win the rematch. Um and it's, it's, it's a shame as well that he parted ways with his coach that he was with for so many years as well. You yeah. know what I mean? So, but that is the sport. Sometimes you got to decide that you want to take a next route. So, I mean, like, where we are now in England, England has some really high profile names in boxing. Yeah. In England, other than AJ, who gets you most excited as a boxer when you look at the boxing scene now in England? Um, you know what? I like I like um Billy Joe. I like the fight with with you. I think it was just announced like last night or this morning, whatever it is. But um, I like Billy Joe. You know what I mean? Like he's got skills. I I don't know if he can beat Canelo because Canelo to me is the pound for pound. But um, you know, I think it would be like a a, a good fight. You know what I mean? Like for me, I like to see the Brits who I grew up and I liked were like Ben, Lloyd Ha Ha gun. Like these guys, they went to America and they fought the biggest names. A lot of the British world champions now or the British guys, the top British guys, is like they're scared to go to the USA. So that kind of I don't like that. You know what yeah. I mean? Um I like guys, if you're gonna be a world champion, you fight all over the world. Like you know what I mean? Like you know yeah. what I mean? Or you fight in the character. A lot of British fans, because we sell 20, 20 K here and we do the arenas here, it don't mean that, like, we just like to go out and watch things. Because if you go to the USA, they don't sell as much as us here. But everyone knows that you have to go over there. If, you're, if you want the big bucks, if you want the, you know what I mean, if you want to do it big time, you've got to go to, like, America. So, for me, the only thing with these um, current these current set of British guys is that they don't go to the USA to try, try to crack the USA enough. Well, AJ did try. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> didn't of course go, not. Didn't go, didn't go his way. Yeah, yeah. No, but this is what I'm saying. This is why it shows how hard it is. Because if that fight has gone on here, he may have won. Because when you go to a next land, everything is not the same. You know what I'm saying? You're out yeah. of your element. Like, folks yeah. don't understand how big a deal that is. Like when, when, when you fight here, you know, everyone, you know, everyone who's working on the show because you work with them time in time out. But when you go abroad, it's a next set and it's a strange environment. Mm. You know what I mean? It's a different commission. The mm. commission where you are from will always protect you. But when you go to another commission, they're going to try to look after their boy more. Mm. So um, it takes, it takes big balls to go abroad and fight, 100%. If it's just for a fight or if it's just, like, to fight for the world, but it takes a lot to go over there. So do you, how, how much of a chance do you give Billy Joe Sanders if uh, against Canelo? Um, well, I always say this. Like, he won't win on points. Like, I don't... He'll never get the decision on points. He'll never get the decision on points. So, um... Unless, unless he can outbox him for like 12 rounds or whatever it is, like he's not going to get the um, um, decision. So the most he could probably do is, um, is fight to a close loss and then get a rematch. But um, 
I think Canelo's the best out there, but I still want to see him fight the two world champions there. That's Plant and that's Bear, that's Bailey Joe. And I think he would be, if he does that, he would be the first undisputed in that weight division. I don't think they've ever had one. No, not, not, a, not a super middle. Yeah, see, so no. that there, that puts you in the history books. That's yeah. big. You know what I mean? That's um, big. And I, I got to ask you this. So, Ashley Theo Payne's top five fighters of all times. Who's your top five from one to five? All right. All right. All right. So, all right. So, it's you not my favorite. got to think about this. <laughs> no, no, no. I wrote it down. Because right. it's not my favorite. It's who I think is like the pound for pound best. Yep. Yep. I got you. All I got right. my top five. I want to hear your top five. All right. So, all right. So for me, my favorite of all time, I think pound for pound, he could have beat any great in in the sport, like prime for prime, is Ray Jones. Okay. Ray all Jones right. is my number one. Like Ray of Jones. All the people I've interviewed over the last several years, you're the first person to put Roy Jones number one. Okay. Got Roy Jones. No, it is. Because the people, they judge these guys that were in there and they're past their best and they're getting KO'd and stuff. Like Ray Robinson, he lost loads of fights that he should not have lost. Like, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? It is what it is. You lose in yeah. this sport. Yeah. Um, all right. So number two. Yeah. Number two, I'm gonna have Ali. Okay, all right. That was my number two as well. Yeah, I'm putting Ali for what he done for the sport. Yeah. I don't think he was the greatest, see, but it's just that he called his, himself the great, the great, greatest. When many folks, like, you know, the great, greatest. But that's what he called himself. Like, Floyd calls himself TB. It is yeah. what it is. You got to believe in you. You have to, as Floyd says, you have to believe that you are the best. Right. So I got Ali at number two for what he did for the sport in and out of the ring. Yeah. All right. My number three. Yeah, my number three is Henry Armstrong. Woo! Come on now, talk to me. Talk. I to had me. to bring one of the the you know I had to go back into you the vault for this one because yeah. loads of folks don't know like what he done. I think he done like he had three weight divisions at the same time. Me. Unheard of. Me. Unheard of. No one would do that now. Yeah. Unheard. Of. And that's when you actually was the best in that weight division because there wasn't four belts. So and you was actually no was the man. So you had to go at that weight class to fight. Yeah. So super featherweight, lightweight, welterweight, done. Exactly. So, and in those days, they didn't have the weights in between. So he truly was fighting big men. Yep. Like, all right. And then, all right. Number, all right. Number four and five. Number four and five, I'm just going to have them together. All right. I, I don't know. Four and five is Ray Robinson and Floyd Mayweather. I don't know who I would put four and who and who I would put five. Okay. All right. All right. So compared to mine. Yeah, go on. I want to hear yours. One, Ray Robinson. Okay. Because the pound for pound thing that we talk about now started with him. Yeah. Fought like 140 times as a welterweight undefeated. I mean, I mean, or one lost one. I mean, something stupid yeah. like that. Yeah, it's unheard of. It's unheard, it's unheard of. of. And he moved to middleweight and then ruled the middleweight division just like he did with the welterweight. So the pound for pound thing that everyone talks about started with that man there. And his, his you know, the opponents that he fought, he fought anytime, anywhere, and, he, and he avenged most of his losses. Two, Ali, you know, speaks for itself. Yeah. Three, I has Mayweather Jr. Okay, okay, okay. And the reason why, because I look at his, not only his current achievements in and outside the ring, but... A lot of the fighters now, I call it, you're doing a Floyd. AJ's doing a Floyd. You know what I mean? Trendsetter. You know? He's a trendsetter. Yeah, so this is what I'm saying. When Floyd dies, he will be remembered. Man, they, they, they should make a movie about him before he dies. But yeah. you know how this thing goes. <laughs> before, I had Roy Jones Jr. Okay. Because okay, okay. in my mind, I would have loved it. But you know what fighters are like? They fight yeah. on, and you're a fighter yourself. Yeah. Kind of fight on a little bit longer than you should have. Yeah. If he had yeah. retired after Ruiz. Thank you. I was just going to say, if once he won, as soon as he won the heavyweight title, Boom. he should have retired, legacy done. Yeah. And then, because you know what it is, as a fighter, if you keep going up and down in weight, that affects you. Yeah. 
and it affects your performance. So when he went from heavyweight and he came back down to super middle, then he started getting uh, KO'd because yeah. he couldn't maintain that weight. Yeah. Number five, Lennox Lewis. Okay, yeah, Lennox, you can roll with Lennox. Yeah, you can roll yes. with Lennox because... Basically, so basically, we got the same list to set for you have Lennox and I have Henry Armstrong. And the reason why I didn't put Henry Armstrong in there because Homicide Hank, especially our younger viewers, they wouldn't know... They, they don't have, know. They don't know about they go Google him. They but have no you idea. If you Google Homicide Hank Aaron, the only fighter in history to hold three weight belts, three belts, at three different weight classes at the same time. And he fought at the same time and defended those belts. I mean, if you find somebody to do that, that's to me is great. But before we go, we got some lightweights I want to talk about. And just tell me who you like the most. We got Teofimo Lopez, a guy you might be familiar with, Tank Davis, a new TMT fighter. Well, not new, but he's been around with TMT for a while with Floyd, one of, one of their um, golden boys. Uh, Danny Garcia, um, not Danny Garcia, um, uh, Garcia, uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan, Ryan, sorry, King Ryan Garcia and, um, Devin Haney. Yeah. Of those four, who do you like the most to rule that? No, group? the funny thing is I sparred with two of them. I sparred with Devin and I sparred with T.O. And then I know, I know on Javon A. Um, see for me. T.O. is currently the man because, you know, he's got all the belts. The undisputed. I would he's say the best... He's out... undisputed. He's unified. Yeah, yeah. Because you got that thing what's going on with the dub dub. It's, it's, it's stupid. stupid. It's stupid. Yeah. All right. So the thing with Tank, I think out of all of them, Tank is just strong, strong. Is the power I've seen. I've seen Tank knock out guys like full weight divisions bigger than him. Like in it, and that's with big gloves on, that's with the hair, hair car, but that's and these have been guys who thought that they could outman him and he just put them to sleep. Mm. I've se- I've never seen a man KO so many guys in camp. Like it wow. was like week after week, boom, 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 putting big guys to sleep in the gym. Wow. So for me, Javon A is a stand. I would put Giovanni up there because his power is crazy. And then you got to put Tio because Tio is kind of currently the man. I've sparred with Devin. Like, I believe in Dev, but I don't know if Devin has the power. He's got the speed. He's got the skills. He's got the brain. Very smart. But I just don't know if he's got the power to um, go at them. With Ryan... Um, the only fight I've seen of Ryan is with Luke, which was, I think, like two months ago, whatever it was. Yeah, Luke Campbell. I, yeah, I think all three of them, the three that I mentioned first, will, will be on um, Ryan. Hence, Ryan was the one who doesn't want to fight there for next. That's like, right. Dev wants to fight next. Dev wants to fight. It's Ryan who's the one who's, who, who's trying to make up excuses why it's not going down. Right. So, um. For me, I would have, my top two is out of Tio and Tank. One of them two, I think. But with Devon, he's got speed skills, but I just don't know um, the power. It's only the power. If, if he can improve the power, that's when. But again, this is what's great about this division. Four young men in the prime years. And I just hope they fight each other. Because what I think, if they will win or not, doesn't mean shit. It's yeah. just an opinion, yeah. but it would be great to see them fight because that's what would make they all four of them are stars. So if they was to fight each other, it'd be great. So, so, so just just to add to that, in in my book, I, I said exactly the same thing. Okay, I had Lopez as number one because he has all yeah. the belts and yeah. he's actually a big lightweight. He could, yeah, he could, that's why he says he's going to move up soon. Yeah, I, I well, his dad always says he should fight at one forty because he fits yeah. the weight better, and when he fought, um. Lomachenko, he, he 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 made the weight, but it was it was a struggle. Yes, yeah, struggle sometimes to make um the lightweight division. So um one forty eventually um two I had Haney because of skill sets. Um, yeah. I think skill set wise, I think he's better than all of them. Yeah. But um Tank, I agree with you. Tank for power, uh, he's the smallest of all those lightweights, but I don't think they can deal with him in terms of power. And if they get when they're with him, they're gonna realize his power in both hands. And it's but not my thing has always been. He's killing these guys with big gloves. When he puts on that eight-ounce glove, that shit must hurt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. 
And the thing for me, even though Garcia won his last fight, I like Ryan Garcia because he's someone who's he's, he's an interesting character, right? He seems like a nice guy. He's like a nice guy. He's well spoken, good looking yeah. kid. He's great yeah. for the sport. Yeah. He's got a ton of money already. Yeah. Um, huge on Instagram. All like I think that's why the people hate him a lot because he's got a huge Instagram following. But to me, that's only another string to his bow. Yeah. When he gets into the ring, he does want to fight. Yeah. And you can see, and he has that sort of uh, straight up stance where he's yeah, flat footed yeah. and he kind of walked like with Luke Campbell. He just basically walked Luke Campbell down. Yeah, who's yeah, a veteran yeah, yeah. fighter. But yeah. Luke don't have the problem I had with him is that Luke don't have power and Luke dropped him. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so but that's it, why I put him at the bottom because that's what I'm saying. T.O. and Tank will put him to sleep. Will put him to sleep. Will yeah. put him to sleep. And Without, that's, the thing, that's the reason why I think even though he's taller than Tank, yeah. Tank has that ability to get to him. But you gotta think Tank has always been short, so he's used to fighting these guys that are tall. So that's why for me, him being short, I don't really see as a big deal because he's always been small for mm. his whole life and he's had to deal with that. So yeah. I don't think that that's gonna be an issue like with him. No, I mean for me, you know, um, I actually think that uh um those four guys, and of that of those four I just mentioned, I think that um Teofimo Lopez at the moment is the only person that could do well at the 140 limit because he has the size right now. The rest of those guys got to grow into it. So look, yeah. man, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, we got to do it again sometime. It's all love, baby. It's all love. Yeah, we got to do it again, love. man. Um, what's what's next for you? What, what's coming up for you now? What's um, so basically during the lockdown, I released my book, so we got to promote the book on Amazon. Raised oh, by the real? hood. Raised right. by the hood. So um. So yes, yeah, so that's basically it. Like I released my book. It's, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit thick. It could have been two books, but basically it, it talks of my childhood, like growing up, like getting into like the streets and stuff. And then half of the book is uh, just me being with Floyd. So it could have been a book about Floyd just cut in half, but I wanted to talk. Basically, I wanted to release this book because of all of the knife crime and all these kids getting into issues because I used to be one of those kids and this, my book basically shows that you can have a bad start because I was around some bad guys doing some bad things. I went to jail, but then I came out, I turned my life around and I ended up being with Floyd and having a, an okay, like professional career. Right. So hence this book is like, you can start off um, bad, but you can change your life and achieve your dreams. So well, that's I, I, expect, I, I expect to get my copy in the mail soon. I'm going okay. to have this. <laughs> I expect to get a copy so I can read that and I can push that book out there. But we okay. can talk about that later. So look, man, um, it's it's been about it's been a pleasure, man. Um, yeah, we're gonna definitely do it again. Um, much love and thank you for having your time here on a Sunday afternoon. There's only two people I've interviewed on a Sunday, you and Don Charles. So, okay. You know, it's two special guys, man. So you know, <laughs> my wife ain't gonna be too happy, but you know, yeah, we're gonna do yeah. that later. So, oh shit. And I, I gotta be a deal with the kids now. It's locked down. It's been brutal with the homeschooling. Yeah. But um, look, man, say, take care of yourself. Stay up, man. This podcast okay. has been sponsored by BoxFit UK, as you know, the biggest uh, supporters in, uh, okay. support of boxing gear in here in the UK. And also um, Doug Foucault, brother who runs uh, Rika Property Management, R-E-K-A, uh, the biggest sponsors of um, this uh, Box Star Forum podcast, as well as Next Phase Fitness. We'd like to thank our guest, Ashley Theo Payne, for giving us time of day, sharing some great knowledge and insight in the sport of boxing inside and out we always will support all of our fighters and all of our coaches inside and outside the game much love to you ashley thanks for your time and uh god bless and stay up and we'll speak soon yes yes take care of yourself bro peace, peace.